Okay, thanks very much for having us today. Uh, two for the price of one from Meta today. Rob, the handsome guy over here on the right, will go conclusions. I'll be the guy setting up the stage for his um, brilliance. I think we have talked broadly, especially for the last year here at Meta, about how AI and AI systems are moving forward to become a dominating class of compute in our data centers moving forward. Alexis gave, I think, a great talk yesterday. She talked uh, completely about sort of the 28 billion translations and things we do a day on our sort of large platforms. But really, I think we want to just put this in scale, right, or in, in context. Oops. <laughs> Um, very large scale drives a, a, a significant portion of our infrastructure moving forward. Clearly things like ranking and recommendations, your Instagram reels, um, video uh, search across our platforms, these are all sort of benefiting we see today from AI, ML, and they will uh, scaling moving forward. Also content understanding is becoming an increasingly important uh, aspect of the services that we deliver to our customers. So things like computer vision, speech, translation, neural language processing, they all become sort of more important. We are gonna speak, I think, primarily about the large clusters today and really sort of put that problem statement out, I think, in front of you, hopefully well. But uh, this is the starting point. We see that the applications and the possibility of moving these uh, AI systems and applications from the data centers and these large sort of Zion and um, Grand Teton platforms that we have, uh, clearly moving those towards the edge where we have even larger presences to sort of support uh, local caching of data. Those opportunities we think exist as well, but you know that'll be sort of the trickle down effect, I guess. So rather than talk about oh, AI, it's the most important thing, I wanted to try and put uh, that into context for you and sort of give you an understanding of why these AI ML systems are driving requirements around IO and why we think that optical IO is an important part of the solution moving forward. So um, training model sizes are growing. I think that's the baseline sort of statement. We're not the first ones to sort of know that, but I think widely across the industry it is now well accepted. Large training size models uh, lead to better results. Large training size models, and we can see here from a couple of different publications, right? I mean, this is a, a Google blog where they reference several different systems that have been deployed. Billions, hundreds of billions of parameters across 2,000, 5,000, 6,000 GPUs in a system. Our own uh, Meta RSC system, which we published, is 6,000 GPUs, uh, 50 plus petabytes worth of cache storage with uh, desire and sort of open plans to grow those to even 16,000 GPUs, 16 terabytes per second of caching, and over an exabyte of storage capacity. Those are today's system built with today's hardware, today's optics. The training model sizes aren't gonna stop growing, they're still significant, they're still gonna keep growing, and so we see that um, you know, these large models are leading to large systems. Large systems require lots of IO to sync the performance across all of these different systems. So, so okay, that's the sort of requirement. We need to build a lot of these things. So what are these things that we're building? We wanna sort of put that in context for you as well so you understand where we are and what the requirements across the IO that we're gonna speak about here and, and Rob will, will put into better context. Um, the, the nodes, the GPUs themselves are getting more and more powerful. As they get more powerful, they take up more silicon size. Silicon size isn't growing, so we're reticle limited. What does reticle limited mean? It means suddenly you go to chiplets, you start thinking about I.O., right? So now we have I.O. chiplets that we're considering putting in there, so we have to worry about that. But then we also have HBM. These systems require lots of memory to sort of cache the models. We're putting I HBM on these packages as well. So if you look maybe at the sort of three most fundamental usage cases for these uh, GPUs or the GPU I.O., it's network I.O. We have a reference here from a recent NVIDIA publication and I'm sure that Craig will tell us more in a, in a little bit. Uh, they're already scaling or planning on scaling 600 gigabytes per second uh, for the network I.O. HBM, just an HBM 3 plus, which is sort of right around the corner, is trending to over a terabyte per second per stack and we've got what? six, eight more stacks of that per package. And then PCIe Gen 3 itself is well over 100 gigabytes per second. So it's not difficult to look at a GPU and think a couple of generations out, it's got 10 terabytes worth of IO just off a of GPU itself. It's a lot, right? <laughs> it's, uh, I think Chris Cole asked the question about ter uh, bits, or, well, I, th I think you were hinting at gigabits versus gigabytes, but I'm gonna reference or try and emphasize gigabytes here. 
And then we talked about 16,000 uh, nodes in our cluster. 16,000 nodes at 10 terabytes per second is a silly number. And I'm not even going to repeat it here. It's sort of astrophysics at that point. And, I, and then sort of practically nuts and bolts. Uh, if we're deploying these, we have to solve these problems. GPUs, as they grow, as they require sort of more bandwidth and more performance to address these sort of applications that we've talked about, the max TDP grows. It's growing sort of exponentially given this curve that my coworkers Whitney and Devatsa uh, talked about last year. And I'm sorry those references aren't coming out. I'll, I'll get to the references if you want. Uh, we're projecting here just in 27, a couple of generations out, well over a, uh, um, a kilowatt for the package itself, including GPU and the HPM itself. So that, that's a significant cooling challenge. And although there's a lot of people talking about liquid cooling and emergent cooling and all those things, it's still a problem. And we'd like to be able to address that. <clears throat> Pluggable optics are great. They work today, they'll work tomorrow. And at some point, you know, they become a, a power challenge. And we want to be able to address that. We want to put that challenge out there in front of our, our industry so that we can start to address it. The IO challenges aren't getting smaller, but the uh, power efficiency targets are. So if we just look here, you know, 1600 um, gigabits per second, you know, we're talking about 20 plus watt pluggable modules, even if the power efficiency is less than 20 picojoules per bit. So anything we can do to bring that down helps. Um, and I guess with that, I will turn it over to Rob. We'll talk about things we can do besides pluggable to make that work if I don't kill us yet. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Okay, so I think Drew's done a pretty good job framing the problem statement for us. What I'd like to do in the next few slides is talk about some of the system implementations that we're using for our AI and ML hardware today, and then how we see those evolving as we go forward in time as these bandwidths continue to increase. So for those of you who haven't taken the opportunity yet, I'd encourage you to go visit the Meta booth in the, um, in the show floor next door and take a look at our Grand Teton hardware that we introduced at this show. So within Grand Teton, it consists of multiple GPUs uh, tied to a switch and then connected to a network at a high level. And so what I'm trying to show in this diagram right here on the left is this is a kind of a cartoon representation of a Grand Teton or one of our earlier Zion class systems, where in this case I'm showing a total of um, you know, two, um, two systems, both comprising eight GPUs shown in green, tied together with PCB traces shown in red, and then finally tied with uh, DAC cables to a network switch and then off to the optical network over in blue. Now, that's how, we, how we do things today. And as, as Drew said, you know, pluggable optics can certainly support the optical interconnect that we use to get to the um, network and then connect multiple systems together. However, as we get to higher and higher bandwidths, and I think Alexis introduced the concept of a terabyte per second of total IO from these accelerators in due course, you can imagine that these things just simply won't scale very well, right? The power doesn't scale very well. Signal integrity will block us from replicating this architecture for subsequent generations. So how might things change? So what I'll show you is a reimagined system on the right-hand side where, as you can see, what we've done is we've eliminated that network switch inside the system. We've also eliminated the PCB traces between the GPUs within the system, and then we're putting the optics directly onto those accelerator packages and then bringing the optics out and connecting it to the back-end network. So what we're doing is we're collapsing I uh, layers of I.O., and then we're taking advantage of low power uh, implementations of things like co-packaged optics and putting the optics natively on the accelerator. So I think that's the theme I wanted to take, you to take away from today is the increased bandwidth and the increased growth uh, in the bandwidth from these accelerators, which is driven by the growth in model sizes that Drew showed you, is then leading us to look for these lower power and more efficient architectures. Okay, so the next slide I'd like to kind of show you, this is the state of the art that we have today in terms of the existing interfaces. And the trend on this, on this table right here is I've summarized different kinds of interfaces going all the way from very, very short reach on-chip interfaces all the way through to network and you know, many kilometer interfaces. And not surprisingly, as we go from very, very short reach interfaces to very long reach interfaces, the efficiency of those interfaces drops. Now, this is a problem when we go to AI and ML, um, your cluster scale, because I need to be able to move bits, you know, many hundreds of meters very efficiently in order for us to get the bandwidth growth that we need for the overall system. So what would we like to see going forwards? This is, 
<laughs> back, thank you. Okay, so this is kind of shown in this lower part of the table. We need to um, work as an industry on a new class of optical interconnects where um, you know, optical interconnects that will support shelf level connectivity, rack level connectivity, and row level connectivity. But rather than spending many tens of picojoules per bit moving, those, moving that data around, we need to be certainly less than five picojoules per bit in order for us to get the bandwidth growth that we need to support these new AI and ML workloads. So there is innovation required here. So the kind of call to action from this presentation is that we need to be focusing on this new class of power optimized interconnects to support these new workloads that we're seeing. So in summary, what I hope we've uh, shown you in this very short talk is we're seeing this ever growing demand in performance. We're get, seeing ever large data sets. The data sets continue to grow exponentially for the models that we're having to train. And so this drives an increased pressure on bandwidth for this um, cluster interconnect across all of the accelerators. We believe that co-packaged optics um, is the best candidates right now that we have uh, visibility to. It'll need tighter optical and electrical integration between the ASICs and the optics to support lower power consumption. And most likely in our case, we would also need to leverage WDM architectures to avoid an explosion in the amount of fiber that we would have to manage. And there's a, a, an opportunity here for co-design of AI and ML systems with optical interconnects and also memory architectures and software that we haven't had time to go into today. But really this is going to require an industry level effort and it's really a kind of a shift where today we have a fairly um, hard delineation between optical interconnects and things on ASICs. This needs to be co-designed and designed in harmony holistically from the get-go. And this is going to require all different parts of the ecosystem to come together and collaborate in order to deliver success on this. Thanks very much for your attention. I think we've got time for a few questions. No? Sorry? <laughs> Thanks, Rob, very interesting. On your IO comparison table, you quite yep. clearly show compute, PCIC itself, and then later on for network, obviously Ethernet. On the optics, you're not saying what protocol they're on. Could you give us a comment? Right, so uh, today in our, um, in our Zion uh, network, I think we, we uh, use Ethernet right now as primary uh, protocol. I think uh, what I would, the way I would characterize this is we would like to remain open-minded. So we're looking for efficiency. We realize there's innovation here. Um, I think open-mindedness, well, I think, I think at a high level, uh, in order to have um, a, a flourishing ecosystem, we need interoperability. So I think, that's kind of the general theme is it needs to be interoperable, but we don't want to be rigid in our thinking as we try to you know, Im improve efficiencies of what we have today. Something needs to change. Maybe the only thing I'll add is, I mean, when we talk about IO bandwidth, it's not just front end network and back end network, it's also sort of memory interfaces. And there's optimizations potentially possible there, maybe even new interfaces. So he was right the first time and <laughs> you're wrong, sorry. <laughs> just, just a follow up question you know, what Richard was asking. With um, the GPU market dominated by, you know, NVIDIA, and, uh, and, you know, also, you know, the DGXs are being sold as a system more and more into the hyperscale, uh, where you could, you have a choice of Ethernet or you could do in InfiniBand, but more and more, I think, moving forward with like H100, most likely it's gonna be, you know, you're gonna be NVLink networking. And that is a proprietary, so how could you create this sort of ecosystem when NVLink itself, it, it, assuming that's going to be the interconnect solution, is proprietary. Well, or is this going to be a, like a one company's, you know, in that case, then why would you bring it to OCP? Because they'll just build everything and sell it to you. Um, well, you ask a lot of, you made a, a lot of really good <laughs> points. I, I, think, I think in general, I just kind of go back to my yeah. response to Richard, which is, you know, in order to have a healthy ecosystem, we believe we need, you know, multi-vendor interoperability. And I wouldn't want to be fixed in my thinking about one protocol versus another protocol and getting the pros and cons of those, but that's kind of our desired end state. And I think we need participation from the industry to go from where we are today to, you know, to, to that end state. Right, but I mean, ultimately, you, you probably want to have something that's more efficient and lower latency than Ethernet. Sounds and great. And now the question is that, is the, is the right solution NVLink and would NVIDIA open that up or I, do we need to come? Like I said, I don't want to get into the pros and cons of different one technology yeah. versus another. Yeah, you have to ask NVIDIA about yeah. those questions too, yeah. sorry. Okay, thank All you right. very much. Thanks.
possible to ask, um, what do you think about this in heterogeneous computing? And what are the implications? Um, well, our, our application is fairly homogeneous, so I would hope that we would be able to support heterogeneous systems as well, right? So, but that, again, this is a, I'm, I'm representing Meta's view. We'd invite participation from, you know, broader parts of the industry. 